Hello, this is John with WesleyGospel.com. Today I'm going to talk about the witness of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit, and um, I'm going to wedge this in between my. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to compare the witness of the Spirit versus uh, Baptistic apologetics. Yes, so we'll see where this leads. John Wesley said in the, the second um, sermon on the witness of the Spirit, uh, the witness of the Spirit discourse 2, um, which is based on uh, uh, Romans 8.16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And in, uh, in part uh, section 3, Part 4 of that, he says this. Uh, this is farther explained by the parallel text, Galatians 4, 6. Because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Is not this something immediate and direct, not the result of reflection or argumentation? Does not his spirit cry, Abba, Father, in our hearts the moment it is given? antecedently to any reflection upon our sincerity, yea, to any reasoning whatsoever? Is not this the plain natural sense of the words, which strikes anyone as soon as he hears them? All these texts, then, in their most obvious meaning, describe a direct testimony of the Spirit. This is core. This is core to John Wesley's uh, belief about the Holy Spirit, this is absolutely at the core of why the Methodists were Methodists and, you know, why they took the name of Methodists instead of, instead of just general Church of England people. Um, this was the thing. Everybody else in the Church of England at the time did not have the witness of the Spirit. They didn't experience the witness of the Spirit. This is what made the, unique, the Methodists unique. This is they, they claimed a direct testimony of the Holy Spirit in their hearts in a voice that said, Up, up, a father. They literally walked around hearing a voice in their in their head say, Abba Father. They literally walked around. Does not his spirit cry, Abba Father, in our hearts? Direct testimony of the Spirit. So literally you could have groups of Methodists walking around London and, um, you know, going to the store, buying something. And then while they're, you know, giving their change back to the merchant, a voice pops in their head and says, Abba, Father. Literally. Uh, this is what was going on with the Methodists. Um, and does this have to come in this form every single time? I wouldn't have to say so, but there has to be some sort of impression, some sort of an experience that rises up within you. My experience in the past couple of years has been, I love you, uh, as a voice that either pops in my head or just flows out of me. This is new and recent, and I think that's probably the Lord just revealing to me the Wesleyan doctrine of the witness of the Spirit. But uh, it's always with the cognizance that either God is speaking to me or I'm speaking to him. And it's, it's a voice, but it's also an emotional compulsion. It'll just happen, happen to me at times where I'm restful and relaxed. And I agree. I mean, this is not a rational process. This is not... You know, and he in the in the sections before this section on the second sermon on the witness of the spirit, where he, you know, sections three uh, one to three, he's 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 talking about how theologians have a tendency to rationalize and draw conclusions and say, well, I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, I am loving and joyful and peaceful. I am self-controlled and humble. 
So therefore, it must have the Holy Spirit by logical deduction. And and Wesley says that there's some truth to thinking that way. There's, it's biblical to think that way. Jesus said that uh, that by their fruits you will know them, and um, and 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 you can even know yourself that to a degree that uh, if you have good fruit in your life, good motives, good sincerity before God, and that you do love God and love people and want the best for them, and um, and you walk in an attitude of joyfulness and uh, humility and self-control and and you have a fear of God and these godly attitudes if you if you have these godly attitudes if you have these godly feelings and thoughts if you have these marks of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5 22 to 23 then you can logically draw the conclusion that you are saved and you can logically rationally draw the deduction that you must have the Holy Spirit but this is what we would call a baptistic sort of attitude towards the assurance of salvation. And uh, and Wesley saw through that. He saw through that. The Bishop of London believed that way. And he's like, up to a certain point, I can agree with him. But that is not a Methodist view of the witness of the Spirit. And so Wesley drew a very sharp distinction between the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and the witness of the Spirit in Romans 8. Romans 8 says witness of the Spirit in Romans 8.16. Galatians 5.22.23 says the fruit of the Spirit. And Wesley is clear to draw a line here. Witness, fruit, not the same thing. Fruit is evidence. Fruit is side effects. Fruit is observational, uh, attitudinal, and behavioral. But fruit is not a witness. And he goes on to explain that a witness is a testimony. It's a testimony. Witness, testimony, like in a court of law. Somebody's brought up to the witness stand. They then give testimony of their experience in the case that in question right if there's a murder trial going on right and there were witnesses they bring the person up to the witness stand and that person will swear on the Bible and give testimony about what they witnessed in the murder case they give they share their experience with the court and with the jury okay when the witness of the Spirit is mentioned in Romans 8.16, we are to imagine that the Holy Ghost, the cloud of the Lord, is going up onto the witness stand, putting its cloud-like hand on the Bible, and sharing its testimony before the court that you are a child of God. It is a completely experiential thing. It is the direct testimony. It is the sharing of either a voice or of a presence or some sort of a spiritual presence from the Holy Spirit of his love for you of you being the child that is adopted by God the Father, and of you feeling the same and likewise. It is a definite spiritual experience of the presence of God, of salvation through adoption, of salvation through being loved by God the Father. It is a comforting, loving either voice or presence or both. Now, that is not the same thing as the fruit of the Spirit. That is not the same thing as rationally deducing and must coming to the conclusion that you must, by logical extension, have the Holy Spirit. And Wesley is very clear. 
in this section, The Witness of the Spirit, Discourse 2, Section 3, to draw to draw the link, draw the line between this rational argumentation sort of thing that you must have the Holy Spirit by logical deduction, and actually ex having an experience of the Holy Spirit recently that testifies to you that you are a child of God, and that you feel likewise, and that you have a stable paternal relationship. With God. Wesley says this again, uh, the witness of the Spirit, Discourse 2, 3.4. He said, this is farther explained by the parallel text Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God hath sent forth his Spirit, the Spirit of his Son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Is not this something immediate and direct? He's talking about an immediate direct experience of the Holy Spirit, not the result of reflection or argumentation, not the result of theological and apologetical logical deduction and conclusion. Well, I guess I have the Holy Spirit because I'm godly. No, a direct immediate experience of the Holy Spirit. Does not his spirit cry, Abba, Father? He's talking about a voice of some type in the heart of the person saying, Father, Father God, something to that effect. In our hearts, the moment it is given, he's talking about a, an experience being given, a gift of the Spirit, antecedently to any reflection upon our sincerity. In other words, it's just an experience of the Holy Spirit before you ever came to the conclusion of theology or rationalizing that you must, by logical extension, be a true Christian. It's just a direct experience of the Holy Spirit, antecedently to any reflection upon your sincerity. Before you've ever come to the point of concluding that you're a sincere Christian, it's just a direct, immediate experience of the Holy Spirit, is what he's saying antecedently to any reflection upon our sincerity, yea, to any reasoning whatsoever. It is a trans-rational experience. It is not a rational experience. It's what a naturalist psychologist would call hallucination. It is not rational. It is a spiritual experience, antecedently to any reflection upon our sincerity, yea, to any reasoning whatsoever. And is this not the plain natural sense of the words, which strikes anyone as soon as he hears them? All these texts then, in their most obvious meaning, describe a direct testimony of the Spirit. And John Wesley and the Methodists were persecuted for that. John Wesley was not allowed into churches to preach this in churches. So he had to create his own gatherings and meetings and oftentimes outside in getting tomatoes thrown at him and being persecuted for this message because most of the people most of the Christians most of the Church of England most of the Christians in John Wesley's day did not have that charismatic experience of the Holy Spirit now, he's not talking about baptism in the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, which is essentially a development that further happened a couple hundred years later out of this Methodist spiritual tradition. But what he is talking about is definitely feeling the presence of God in the heart region and hearing some type of a voice like Abba Father rising up within you. That's what he's talking about. He, he, and, he, and he emphatically says, I, I am talking about a mystical experience here. I am not talking about people rationalizing their way into concluding that they must have the Holy Spirit because they examine their behavior. While there is some degree of admission for the usefulness of that, it's just not good enough when compared to the witness of the Spirit. You've got to have this, otherwise there's no way you can really be sure that you're saved. And as you can see, a message like that is basically like saying, 
you know, like some Pentecostals say, unless you speak in tongues, you're going to hell. Well, Wesley wasn't saying that, but what he was saying is that unless you have the witness of the Spirit, you're going to hell. He did say that. Um, now you might say, well, what about our faith in the cross? What about, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but if you have faith in the cross and you don't have the witness of the Spirit, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Okay. And so uh, you don't really have faith in the cross if you don't have the witness of the Spirit. If you don't have the witness of the Spirit, you're going to hell. He believed that. And as, as time went on, you know, he extended that to lordship salvation. And, and, you know, because the witness of the Spirit makes a person love God and want to obey his commandments. So while John Wesley was a lordship salvationist, just like John MacArthur, he was a charismatic lordship salvationist. He believed that you're not going to be saved and go to heaven unless you both have the witness, direct testimony of the Spirit, and you live in lordship salvation. And you live in obedience to God's commandments. It's not about perfection. It's about having this orientation towards being a Christian. It is not about being perfect. When John Wesley uses the word perfection, he's talking about making improvement in your life in obedience to God and being conscious of his spirit. Now, nobody can have the witness of the spirit 24-7. And I'm pretty sure that if you dig into his writings, you're going to find him admitting that. But you need, you need to at least have it once, and I would have to say you need to have it recently. Uh, you can lose the spirit. You can grieve the spirit. If you don't know what that means, it's only because you've never had the witness of the spirit. And you will know that certain things grieve him. And you're going to try to retrace your steps and make sure that you don't fall back into that again. The whole concept of backsliding was built off of this. And it was, it was, it was. Man, I got to do everything I can to not lose the witness of the spirit. The whole concept of losing salvation was based off of losing the witness of the spirit. Man, let's not get there. Let's not go there. This is so precious, so unique. I don't want to ever lose this. So the Baptistic crowd, the mainline liberal crowd today, the non-charismatics. They are, they are the people that Wesley would say, dude, you guys need the witness of the Spirit, or you don't even know the Lord. He made it an issue of salvation. If you don't have experience of the Spirit of God, you're lost. You're lost. You go to church, you read the Bible, you have theology books, but you don't got the Holy Spirit. And you can argue, and you can debate, and you can talk about Lee Strobel, and you can talk about Gary Habermas, and you can try to argue weird things like uh, because Jesus folded his clothes when he rose from the tomb, that proves he rose from the dead. And all these weird apologetic ideas that are floating out there. Oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead because he folded his linens in a certain way, and that proves he rose from the dead. Believe it. Believe that there are people out there that are so naturalistic in the way they approach Christianity. Calvary Chapel people, Baptist people, Church of Christ. They have such a non-charismatic approach to Christianity that they get into this field called apologetics where they will naturalistically come up with strange intellectual arguments to defend Christianity. One of which is, yeah, because the shape of Jesus' clothes was shaped a certain way, when he rose from the dead, that proves the existence of Jesus' resurrection. And everybody, come and believe now. Ridiculous. This is the type of weird, strange stuff that people come up with. It's just intellectual swirling, an intellectual labyrinth. And there's no Holy Spirit in any of it. And Wesley steers you away from that. He says, no, don't do this to yourself. 
you accept the charismatic form of Christianity or you reject Christianity. Because the only form of real Christianity is charismatic Christianity. It's the only form there ever is and ever will be. And if you do not have an experience of the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. You're just jangling about and bandying about a bunch of strange intellectual concepts. That's all you're doing, but you still ain't got no Holy Spirit. Wesley's as firm as he could be on that. You know what? And I agree with him. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.